Okay. Good afternoon. We've met quorum and the August 7th, 2023 meeting of the WVU Faculty Senate will come to order. The minutes of the July 10th Faculty Senate meeting have been distributed as a link in your agenda. At this time, are there any corrections or additions to the June minutes? Okay, hearing no corrections, the minutes from the July 10th meeting are approved as written. The next item on the agenda is my report. I would like to begin by acknowledging the highly difficult time we find ourselves in with almost half of our programs under review and faculty living in uncertainty with the potential loss of their jobs, colleagues, and programs. This is unprecedented and it's painful for all of us. In addition to faculty, we'd also like to recognize the strain that department chairs and other unit leaders have been under leading the review process. We've heard the anguish coming from chairs and we want to acknowledge your incredible effort and your courage in walking through this process. The Faculty Senate leadership continues to work to represent your input and concerns about the current budget situation and the academic transformation process. To keep you informed of work conducted on your behalf by the Faculty Senate leadership, I'd like to highlight some of the activities we've been undertaking since our meeting in July. First, we discussed with the provost the faculty concern that non-R1 dollars were not presented as key data elements in selecting programs for review and were not built in as a direct part of the program review process. We recognize that many programs have substantial non-R1 funding, much of which provide material support in these units and are in support of WVU's land grant mission. We recommended that a report of all research dollars by unit be secured and added to the determination of the preliminary recommendations to units. Next, we distributed the resolution on faculty input to the program review process that um, our senators, you all passed in the July 10th meeting to all faculty and most importantly to chairs and deans. And based on your feedback, we advocated to change changes to the program self-study rubric, which many people expressed concern about, and for clarifying communications to faculty about the intent and focus of the self-studies. And ultimately, those changes were implemented by the provost's office. We are advocating for maximum transparency for self-studies, preliminary recommendations, and appeals, and we feel very positive that um, we're going to, to see that come to fruition. We met with President Gee and have advocated for reviews of his office staffing, as well as re uh, a complete review of student life, both of which President Gee has assured us will be reviewed and results shared openly. We met with the provost's office to discuss a review of the provost's office staffing. And an update to Faculty Senate is tentatively scheduled for the August 28th Faculty Senate meeting to summarize that process. We're also advocating for the Dean's offices, including Health Sciences, to conduct staffing reviews and to make those reviews and decisions transparent. President Gee has said that there are no sacred cows and that no stone should be left unturned and we have taken him at his, his word. We've also initiated discussions about teach out plans and have advocated that backup plans be established to prepare for situations where some or all faculty may leave a unit prior to the end of the teach out period. We've provided suggestions to Rob Alsop's team on the survey, seeking feedback on the services of the strategic initiatives unit, part of his review of his unit. You should have gotten that in your inbox, um, I believe yesterday. We met with Rob and have received a detailed summary of the WVU debt structure and the public-private partnerships, including occupancy rates, which have been brought up as concerns by faculty for a few months. Uh, Rob has provided very detailed documents on both of these topics. You can find them on the Transformation tab on the Faculty Senate website. I do encourage you to take a look at those. 
We attended the uh, Provost Summer Work Group and updated notes from those meetings have been posted on the Transformation tab on Faculty Senate website as well. We've been notified by the Provost Office that that work group will continue into the fall. So I don't know what we're going to call it, but it won't be the summer work group anymore. Uh, but we will continue to post updates on that same site from those meetings. And finally, we secured a vote from the Executive Committee acting on behalf of the Faculty Senate to approve the new general syllabus statement related to chat GPT and other generative AI platforms. The general statement, as well as other sample options, uh, was developed by a team of faculty led by Evan Witters and then predominantly the TLC and was approved by the Faculty Senate Teaching and Assessment Committee this summer. So thank you to everyone for pushing that through so it could be into faculty's hands for their use for this fall. The only other item is I have is a reminder that our next meeting will be face to face. August 28th at the College of Law. That will be a semi-normal, <laughs> regular meeting, and um, but again, with a primary focus on academic transformation. So at this time, are there any questions for me? Okay, hearing none, uh, the next item on our agenda is an item for approval. A resolution is presented in Annex 1 to urge unit leaders to seek robust faculty input in unit appeals about preliminary recommendation. Corey, are we going to get that up on the screen? Yeah, give me just one moment. I'm yep. going to navigate on a laptop through the power outages here. Corey is at his third location for power. Coming up on the screen now. The resolution reads, resolution on faculty input in preparation of unit program appeals. Whereas West Virginia University has engaged a process of program portfolio review to address its identified $45 million structural deficit, and whereas identified units and programs under review have engaged a self-study process and will receive the provost preliminary recommendations to the Board of Governors based on said studies, and whereas a process to appeal those preliminary recommendations as prescribed by BOG Rule 3.2.3 will be made available to units and programs, and whereas faculty input is critical to the operations and effective governance of said units and programs. Therefore, be it resolved that the West Virginia University Faculty Senate urges unit leaders to seek faculty input in the development of any appeal of the provost preliminary recommendations and whenever possible, include a faculty representative on the unit team presenting the appeal. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? I move that we approve the resolution. Thank you, Diana. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Scott. Any discussion? Yes, Matt. Matt Valenti? Yeah, hi, I'm just waiting for hey, my Matt. video. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is Matt Valenti from the Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. Um, yeah, I just wanted some clarification on the resolved part, and I'm not sure who can answer the question because I'm not sure the source of the uh, resolution, but it's um, talking about because resolve that unit leaders seek faculty input. Now, a unit leader, my understanding is that would typically be a department chair and department chairs are themselves faculty. And so the last part says, including a faculty representative on the unit team presenting the appeal. First of all, I'm not exactly sure what's meant by a unit team, um, but to the extent that it is a team of faculty, it's asking for faculty representation, but then could it not be that the faculty representative is the unit leader themselves, given that they're a faculty member? So I guess I don't yes. think that's intent, but maybe um, if someone, I don't know where this came from, if someone could just sort of explain what that last part means and what the intent is. Well, it came from it came from faculty senate leadership. We are introducing the resolution because we think it's important that faculty have input on the appeals and that they not they not just happen behind a closed door and get sent up. Having said that, the term unit is is a broad term that's being used by the provost's office, and and in some cases, 
These are school directors. In some cases, they are department chairs um, and, 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 and a variety of other things. In the case of law, it's a dean. And so it's, it's all variety of, um, of, of types of positions or types of units that are doing the reviews. But having said that, yes, I mean, that could be the case that a faculty uh, member is represented as the chair. Our overarching purpose in this is that this doesn't just happen with no input from the faculty team of the unit. Would you would you like to us to make a motion to change that wording? Would you um, like a motion to change the wording? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can offer a better wording, but yeah, I think your explanation was uh, helpful. Thank you. Any other discussion? Good. Um, so at this time, we'll move to a vote on the resolution. And all those in favor of approving the resolution on faculty input in the preparation of unit program appeals, please raise your hand. It's like 71. Please lower your hands. All those opposed to the resolution on faculty input in the preparation of unit program appeals, please raise your hand. And seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you all, and we will share that out. Our next agenda item is a report from our representative to state government, Eloise Elliott. You're up, Eloise. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I first of all, I just wanted to let you know that I was elected the chair of the State Advisory Council of Faculty or the ACF as we know it um, for the coming academic year. Um, in case you're not aware of the ACF, it's a bottle of body of representatives from all public colleges and universities in the state. And our role is that's established by West Virginia Code. Um, is an advisory board to serve as a resource and advisor to both the legislature and to the Higher Education Policy Commission on any matters related to higher education. And so related to other state university news, um, Provost Reed, are you going to talk a little bit about the Alderson Broadus, um, what we're doing with Alderson Broadus students as a university? I was not planning to talk about that today. <laughs> okay, well, I can say a few words about that. I, I got right. some information from Sharon Martin this morning, but then um, George Zimmerman told me he thought that you were going to speak to this, so I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to um, interrupt your your remarks, but. I have been asked a couple of questions about, well, what are we doing at WVU? Because some of the media that's come out hasn't really mentioned us, WVU, as coming, stepping up to try to help these students. But in fact, we are doing all kinds of things at WVU to work with these students um, and to recruit them to come to WVU. So um, some of those steps that we've taken um, and some of you may know these things, we're waiving application fees and um, expediting the review process for these students, the first time freshmen and first time transfer students. Um, we're also providing exceptions to institutional merit and needs-based aid deadlines so they can qualify. We are also um, providing information to all the recruiters and advisors across the campus on how to help the AB students. Sharon also said that related to the teach out programs or other special considerations, those students will go through our traditional process through the registrar's office um, and the registrar's office will prioritize those based on student. And um, also related to the physician's assistant program, that the AB, um, that AB University had, that most likely we're not going to be able to accept them in the spring cohort due to clinical space and program capacity, but we'll still be working with, with those students. And also the School of Nursing has been working with students directly 
from AB. Right now we have 40 first time transfers apply and eight of those have been admitted so far. So that's just in a week's time. And that's that's all I have. Do you, if anyone has any questions about that, I'll try to answer. Any questions for Eloise? Okay, thank you, Eloise. And congratulations on being elected to the chair of the WVACF. I know you do a great job. Well, thank you. Okay, our next report is from our one of our representatives to Board of Governors, Stan Heilman. Stan? All right, as I'm sure many of you know, we had a meeting on July 31st, a special meeting of the board, uh, where we looked at rule changes to Board of Governors Rule 4.7, uh, where there were some changes <laughs> made to provide clarification uh, on that rule that that rule uh, passed. The changes to that. We also examined uh, changes in the severance package. Um, as many of you know, before it was simply aimed more at tenure track faculty and uh, teaching faculty with long term contracts. TAPS and SAPS have now been included uh, in that 12 week severance package. There was uh, some language in the amended document which excluded clinical and library faculty. Um, after discussion of that, that was uh, struck from the rule and uh, the inclusion of that faculty will be discussed uh, further going forward. And then finally, um, you know, we voted to extend President Gee's contract uh, for another year to get us through uh, the transformation process um, and to be able to, to gauge the impact of that. Um, we have another special board meeting on August 22nd and a regular board meeting on September 15th. And as you guys have probably seen, um, rationales for those votes, uh, we put out a document earlier today, and that is included as Annex 2 uh, in the Senate agenda. Questions for Stan or me? Um, there's a question in the Q&A. Are Board of Governors meetings recorded? Uh, are, they, are they meetings recorded and posted online? Uh, I believe they are. I don't know how up to date they are. I'll check. And if you, if we, if we could, if each, if you, uh, if you'd like to ask a question or speak, please raise your hand so we can do this in normal order. Um, and people can identify themselves and ask their question. Okay, um, anything else for Stan? Thank you, Stan. Um, our next agenda item is a report from President Gee. Hey, President Gee. Thank you very much. And I, I think the answer to that question was that yes, uh, we do stream our Board of Governors meetings and they are recorded too. I think uh, uh, we'll just, as to where those are archived, I'm not quite certain, but I'm certain you can go on the Board of Governors um, uh, website and find that out. So thank you, Frankie, I appreciate it. Um, and I wanna take this opportunity to thank both Frankie and Stan who served as representatives and faculty on our Board of Governors. This was Frankie's first uh, meeting, as a matter of fact, and uh, she survived. Uh, this is a... Uh, this is a, a, a very a daunting service that anyone provides as a faculty member. These are challenging times, as we all know, and I appreciate their, their really thoughtful leadership uh, as we navigate these issues. I know that Provost Reed will share her report on the progress made on the program portfolio review, um, but, uh, I meet regularly with all of our team and she and the provost has kept me updated on their activities. And I can say without a doubt, uh, they have been working diligently. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm in my office right now and they were in the office next to me in the president's conference room uh, all day long. Meeting. Um, so uh, they have great intention to ensure that the decisions we make um, are the right ones for the university for our students. Uh, uh, the Board of Governors, as you know, has made it very clear that they expect us to move swiftly and expeditiously so that we can 
move the university forward um, and the timelines we are meeting reflects their expectations and the urgency of the times. Now, we have a new board chair, uh, Tanya Willis Miller, um, and she and I have been talking extensively and we are both keenly aware the decisions we make um, will have a personal impact. Um, and I am very much aware of that. And that does weigh on me and weighs on all of us. Uh, no one ever likes to see a change of uh, a change of assignments or a loss of jobs, but we also know that the times in higher education are changing. Uh, in fact, I was just reflecting on that a few minutes ago that uh, over this past weekend, as you know, there was a major um, upheaval in terms of college athletics. Uh, and last week, uh, one of the Power Five conferences, one of the most storied, the, the Pacific Coast Conference, uh, literally, literally disappeared overnight, um, leaving a number of institutions uh, stranded. Um, those are the kind of quick changes that are occurring in higher education. And our board leadership know that we must change uh, as quickly if we are going to be a land grant university of the future. Though correcting our structural deficit is difficult uh, and is critical, it is perhaps even more critical that uh, we examine what we are doing as a university. And as I have said on a number of occasions, invest in the academic uh, portfolios and programs and, and activities that are most useful to our students. Though it is difficult to evolve in my conversations during my county tours this summer, this idea of transformation of the university, I can tell you has been very well received. Um, our constituents, particularly our students and our families are telling us what matters most. And I have been on this listening tour now for the past two and a half months, uh, they want a degree that will lead them to a career they love and one that provides for their future. And they want to be able to afford that degree. And uh, to, to deliver those two needs, uh, we must be relevant in what we are offering in academic programs. And we must continue to con contain and contour our costs while improving our quality. And that latter point is something I will always emphasize. We must be better through this process. Um, so although I realize this is a difficult time, it is, it is in my view, um, an incredibly uh, necessary time. In fact, there's existential um, issues facing higher education at the moment. And uh, I can assure you that um, we will all work through this stressful days ahead. And, um, and I believe very, very much that we'll be at the end of this process which will never end ultimately, I can assure you, uh, a stronger university. So Madam Chair, um, I know that there will be uh, significant questions and I will look forward to, um, to answering those questions uh, following the provost report, which I think would be better. Okay, so President Gee, you're holding off on taking questions until after the provost report? Yeah, okay. I think that would probably be easier, okay? Okay, but I sure. will certainly be open for questions. Okay. Um, and so at this time, we'll turn it over to Mary Ann for report on academic transformation. Great. Thank you very much, Frankie. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So this week, the provost's office will be developing the preliminary recommendations resulting from the program portfolio review process. To date, team members have reviewed all 25 self-study reports from the academic units that had programs identified for further review. The faculty and staff in those units should have seen those reports and had the opportunity to provide feedback. If that is not the case, you need to let our office know. Um, but we were under the uh, distinct impression that folks had been able to see those reports. The quantity and quality of feedback we receive varied quite a bit with some units overwhelming us with their own data and information that may or may not have been relevant directly to what we were trying to achieve, while others made a good faith effort to show us how they could be more efficient and effective. And we will certainly take 
um, that feedback um, into account as we uh, make our decisions. We also met with our deans individually to receive their input since they know their colleges and they know what is possible and what is not. Members of President Gee's senior leadership team are also weighing in. We plan to finalize the preliminary recommendations over the next few days and to send them to the unit leaders on Thursday afternoon. Uh, these leaders will then have 24 hours to share the information with faculty and staff in their units. We will share our preliminary recommendations with the entire campus community next Monday and publish them on our academic transformation website. We have spent a great deal of time on this work um, to be as thorough and responsible as possible, and it has been all consuming. As a result, we are behind in our review of the academic support units or the ASUs. Our current plan is to complete that work and present our recommendations for changes um, to the board at the September meeting. Um, I also want to alert Senate that later this week, we will be announcing another academic restructuring. I cannot share the particulars right now since not everyone in those units have been notified um, yet. Uh, but I did want to give you all the heads up because it is coming. Um, and I did not want you to be blindsided by that. Um, I'm going to be asking, calling, I'd say calling up to the podium, but asking Rob Alsop to, uh, to talk a little bit about the transformation efforts on the non-academic side of the university. And when he is done, <laughs> We will all be here to take questions um, in addition to other members of my team and the senior leadership team. So I'm gonna hand it over to Rob. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, um, Frankie, I really appreciate you working with me on the requests on the debt service and the public-private partnership information. And it's led to a good dialogue of providing additional information so that um, we can continue to have good discussions and, and um, at the institution. So one of the things we have been working on is how we review um, from an administrative perspective um, the, the non-academic units. There has been some work, whether it be shared services or some of the modernization project where we have moved um, the institution forward and tried to become more efficient and moderate costs. Um, and in addition to that, we are also working on I would say similar, but not exact to the academic support unit um, review of information moving forward. And so the first up for that were the strategic initiatives units. So IT and facilities and finance budget, um, um, our auxiliary and business service units. Um, we started that process this week. And so you should there will be a self-study. Um, there will be stakeholder input. Um, we will take all of that data. We are also benchmarking um, our units within strategic initiatives. So for example, um, we've looked at um, our number of employees compared to metrics from trade organizations and other institutions of higher education that we plan where applicable and a corollary to what we're doing uh, to present going forward. For the strategic initiatives review, um, it is our goal to do the self-study and stakeholder survey over the next eight to nine days. That'll give us an opportunity to do a data and response review. Um, we hope to take our recommendations internally to our team and then have a discussion at the September Board of Governors meeting as it relates to the strategic initiatives units um, moving forward. We also, over um, the past several days, have been working through with other units. And so I can tell you that last week and this week, I've been working with Corey Ferris um, and folks in the president's office to do a review relating to student life. And so we've taken, um, we built our stakeholder survey and self-study based off of the academic service unit. Student life is going to take both of those and develop something that's consistent and will work for student life. And that will go out. And so I, I apologize that there may be a rolling request for feedback on different units of the institution, but it was sort of betwixt and between, do we send it all at once? And there's a really long survey that takes a long time or do we do it on more of a rolling basis? We decided on more of a rolling basis to learn as we go. 
So you will see in the coming days additional emails and requests for information on how our units um, are doing moving forward. And uh, the goal is uh, at our September meeting uh, to have continued discussion on um, how we can make our administrative units more efficient and effective in serving our students um, and our faculty as we move forward for the institution. So more to come on that, and we will be reporting out the results of this activity on the self-study, the stakeholder engagement, and the benchmarking as it relates to um, administrative units and um, the folks we serve at the institution. So with that, um, Marianne, I'll kick it back to you. And I, I think um, maybe you indicated it'd be time for, for questions for uh, Gordon, you and myself, and, and happy to, to answer what I can. Thanks so much, um, uh, Frankie. We've got the three of us, members of my team, as well as um, um, our general counsels on the call. And um, I think that might be it. Oh, and, uh, and uh, Vice President uh, King. Okay, so um, questions for President E, Provost Reed, Rob, um, Stephanie, the general counsel, Fred King from research. Looks like um, Matt. Yeah, hi, um, this is Matt Valenti from Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. I think this might be a Marianne question um, and it pertains to um, certain teaching track and service track faculty. So uh, as you know, at WVU, we have teaching track and service track faculty who are on multi-year contracts. Um, and so on a given year, um, let's say a third of those faculty who are on three-year contracts will just happen to be expiring. So this year there will be um, some, if not many um, faculty who will be having their terms just naturally expire in May of 2024. So um, my question is, um, if you could clarify the university's intent regarding these faculty, the ones whose um, contracts are set to expire, and in particular, um, if a unit is subject to a RIF, then um, how will those faculty be handled? So for instance, um, if one of these faculty whose contract is set to expire is identified for a non-renewal, uh, will they be covered under the scope of the REF? So will they be given severance pay? Will they be given um, notification in October um, and, and perhaps a right to appeal? Or uh, in the alternative, um, will these uh, individuals just have their contracts lapse? Um, they wouldn't be notified until later, until let's say May, when they not get severance or a right to appeal. So if you could perhaps clarify that, I think uh, our colleagues who are in that situation would appreciate knowing uh, their fate earlier rather than later. Thank you, Matt. And actually, I think I'm going to defer to Stephanie um, or Tracy at my shop. Stephanie, is that is that a question for you or for Tracy? Yeah, and Tracy and I can handle that together. And I apologize, I'm not on video at the moment. Um, so, uh, Matt, thank you for your question. Um, so, for people who are TAPS or SAPS, whether they are um, uh, their contract ends this year or next year or the year after, I mean, depending on what, regardless of the end date, if their program is subject to a program review um, and then their position is chosen to be eliminated, um, we will end their contract on May 9th of, of uh, 2024. And those individuals will be subject to um, the severance payment, which is approximately, or I'm sorry, is 12 weeks. Um, and they will be notified in that October timeframe um, with everybody else on that. Now, that being said, if you are a TAP or SAP and your contract is subject to, um, like this is the last year, it, it, it naturally ends on May 9th, 2024, um, there are some, TAPs and SAPs potentially in other programs who are not subject to program review, whose contracts may end um, or not be renewed. Um, this particular year, that happens every year. You know, there's always a, a handful um, where that might be the case. It is our goal 
to also try and notify those folks in the October timeframe at the same time um, so that folks have as much uh, notification as possible. And, um, and so that was kind of, uh, I think Matt, I answered all of your questions, but if I missed a piece of it, you know, let me know and I'll happy to answer it. Or if Tracy, if I misstated anything, please, please let me know. Thank you, Stephanie, that's it. Yeah, no, thank you, Stephanie. I think that answers my question, and I think that's good. I would urge the university to give notice, you know, as early as possible. I know that's the intent for most faculty, but, you know, there's this class of faculty. I just, uh, you know, wanted to make sure it didn't get, you know, fall through the cracks. But, yeah, thank you for the answer. Okay, thanks, Matt. I'd like to just piggyback on that if I could. I mean, we've we have also heard a concern that there could be another wave as as per the wave that happened in June of this year that was um, not as data driven as as what's happening right now. And I think there's fear that we're going to go through this data driven process and then there's going to be another wave of non renewals, not under that program review process and won't be as data driven. So um, Frankie, again, happy to answer that question and, and Tracy and others can chime in. Um, so for, I'm going to talk, just talk for, for uh, staff, whether it's classified or non-classified, uh, we do uh, renewals every year at different points in time in the year um, for different positions for any number of reasons. I anticipate that will continue. So not all of those will be notified in the October timeframe because there'll be other reasons to do non-renewals or risk for classified folks throughout the year as is normal from year to year. Uh, for our faculty, as I indicated before, um, our, it is our intent um, that if somebody is going to be non-renewed, a, a, a TAP or SAP, that that will also occur in the October timeframe. Um, those would be um, one-offs um, dependent on um, individual colleges and programs, so it's hard to generalize. But again, the the plan is to do those notifications in that same time frame too, so it won't happen towards the end of the academic semester, which you know, unfortunately is what what happened um, um, this past year. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Stan, oh, I'm gonna raise my voice. Stan Cohen, committee retired faculty. Um, I believe this is a question to uh, Mr. Alsop. Uh, in today's Dominion Post, there was an article about a special session now uh, underway, and there was a one of the appropriation bills named Marshall University as having an amount of, I think, about $24 million to cover their budget deficits. But I did not see anything else in the article regarding our budget deficit at WBU. Thank you for any information you can provide. Sure. So the um, as context during the regular session of the legislature, um, the legislature set aside around 200 to 210 million dollars. Actually, it was I think 260 million for all of higher ed and corrections. We think 50 to 60 was set aside for corrections and around 200 for higher ed for deferred maintenance. And so we think WVU will receive a fair share of that $200 million. In addition to that, um, leadership from the West Virginia University Health System, WVU Medicine and the university went together to ask uh, the legislature to provide $50 million to help um, WVU and the WVU Health System attain an NCI cancer designation to help improve cancer outcomes and to increase um, the depth and breadth of our services as it relates to cancer um, treatments for w for West Virginia and for Appalachia. And both of those efforts um, were successful. Coming off of that success with the $50 million for the cancer money, um, our colleagues at Marshall have asked the legislature to help fund the remaining $45 million as we understand it for infrastructure relating to their facility that hosts primarily their cybersecurity programs. And as the legislature has told us and reiterated um, fairly often, including recently, 
The legislature is not interested in backfilling operations or budget deficits. What it will do is invest in projects on areas of need for the state um, going forward. And so it is my understanding that the legislature will be considering a governor, the governor's request to help Marshall complete their infrastructure that's needed for their cyber related programs and not just to offset a budget deficit going forward. We have heard loud and clear from the legislature that as it relates to operational revenues for the university that we need to succeed under the funding formula that's been put into place and our discussions relating to um, those types of areas um, are not likely at all to be successful, that they're willing to entertain one-time uses of monies for projects to move um, West Virginia and institutions of higher education forward. Um, to that end, we are considering and working towards this January legislative session towards the types of asks that we think would be successful from a legislative perspective going forward. Um, and so the appropriation that the legislature is considering for Marshall is for infrastructure and not for operational deficits, as we understand it. And we've been engaged with members of the House, the Senate, and um, the governor's office in understanding this appropriation. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, we were thrilled to get the $50 million for cancer. We hope that it is the first of many requests from the legislature going forward. Um, and so it's one of those things where, you know, the fact that the legislature is not only considering investing in WVU, but in other areas of higher education is an indication of the value proposition that the legislature sees in WVU and Marshall. And so from my perspective, you know, you think about well, gee, wouldn't it be great if we got that $45 million for WVU? And it would be. Coming off the $50 million for cancer, I think that's a hard ask and the deferred monies. And so if you think if they're going to spend another 40 or $45 million on all the things that the legislature could spend it on, that they're investing in higher education for cyber is not the worst thing in the world. And so I know that that's, that's sort of a big picture view on it. We do think this gives us the opportunity in the future to prove our case for additional investments in, at WVU going forward. And this is, this is, the, this is a component re part response to our success in getting the cancer money. And we think it also continues the narrative of the need for the legislature to continue to invest in higher education. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Dave. Yeah, if I could get uh, Stephanie Taylor to clarify something that she said a few moments ago, I, I gathered that there's additional taps and saps and caps that are not part of programs that have been tagged for transformation that are likely to not have their contracts renewed uh, come this fall or maybe even this spring. That's the first we're hearing of that. Uh, I suspect the anxiety level of a whole lot of people just went up um, because I've Several folks thought they were relatively safe since they were in departments and programs that had not been tagged for transformation. But now it sounds like those folks should also worry. I'm not saying necessarily that, but I'm saying that each year there are TAPs and SAPs that are non-renewed when their contract ends. And so whether that's part of program review or not, that is something that does happen um, and could again happen this year outside of the program review process. However, um, we're working with our, because of the uncertainty of everything going on with transformation this year, we're working with our deans and our department units to try and identify those if they need to be done um, this fall so that people have as much notification of that as possible. Yeah, let me, if I could, and then I'll ask Gordon or Marion if they want to add in on, but let me, let me just add a little bit of perspective, David, because I think it's a very fair and good question. Um, it is our goal, I think, as a leadership team, that we go through the academic transformation and identify the programs necessary for what we're doing moving forward for the institution. Um, it is our goal, I think as Stephanie indicated, to provide notification as much as we possibly can through September of those folks who come May will be need to looking elsewhere as for um, their employment. And it is our goal to get back to a normal course of business as an institution, perhaps through a little bit more of um, 
um, robust program review going forward as we've discussed about as we go through, but to not get where we're going through this type of process going forward. And we are working to identify those individuals through September. I don't, I think as far as the anxiety level, which was of your question, this is not to put every tap and sap on notice that, 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 oh my goodness, you need to be looking for a job elsewhere or anything like that. I just, I think Stephanie's comments are through the ordinary course of business, could a dean or a chair as they're moving forward for their budget make a determination to do a non-renewal. And we did not completely take that all the way off the table. And so I just didn't, we don't want there to be a surprise that through that sort of more normal course after we get through October, that there may be a one-off where a dean or a chair decides to make a decision from uh, that point moving forward in that vein, as opposed to, oh, gee, all of our TAPs and SAPs are going through an additional review beyond academic transformation. That is that is not our, our intent moving forward. And I think Marianne Gordon jump in if I'm wrong, but it is our goal to make all the identifications that we possibly can as we work through September going forward. And so th this, th David, this is, I would consider it more of a, a one-off um, than it would be oh, hey, there's some separate review that you're hearing about the first time going forward on, on how that. So, um, Marianne Gordon, jump in if I'm if I'm Yeah, well, sure. no, I think you're absolutely right. And David, I want to just answer that question by saying that uh, remember what I've said all along, and that is that, uh, that we're trying to do this process so that we squeeze fear out of the system rather than adding fear. And that's the reason that we, that we think that speed is enormously important. So, uh, so as Rob said, if, if in the normal course of business, there may be a one-off here or there, but, but generally, and in fact, almost always, uh, those programs that have been identified um, as, uh, as uh, not under review, that I think that uh, you can be assured that the people inside inside those programs are uh, are going to be moving forward so I, I i hope that that takes the as i say that i hope that squeezes the fear out of the room okay questions thank can i ask a question thank you both yes alan uh, my name is alan Toma. i'm from the college of medicine uh for some of us new senators and i apologize if this is in another place that we were supposed to have seen but even in the email that was sent out today could someone provide just a little uh update for some of the terminology we're using like what does uh rif stand for and tap and sap for those of us who are new so that we can kind of understand what is being discussed uh, who, who would like mary <laughs> I'll just say tap and sap. It's a teaching a faculty who are classified. Uh, they're non-tenured faculty who have a specific classification as a teaching faculty member. You can be a teaching assistant, a teaching associate, a teaching uh, professor, and the same tr is true on the service side. It's not as common on health sciences, so it's not a term that you may be as familiar with. Um, a lot of times on, on health sciences, that these are clinical faculty who don't have the same um, you know, the same name or title associated with it. And RIF means reduction in force. Thank you. Other questions for President Gee, Rob, Marianne, at all? Yes, Scott. So uh, I have a question for President Gee, just following mm -hmm. up on the contract extension. I know Stan and Frankie have been inundated with communications. Uh, just wondering if you are willing to elaborate on your plans beyond June of 2025. My plans beyond June of 2025 is to return to the law school and start teaching again. That's that's my plans, uh, and uh, I have no I have no plans beyond that, other than you know um, opportunities that may exist to. Uh, to do some lecturing, uh, other kinds of things, which I have had a lot of, uh, as you know. And but but my my, my intent is to uh, to be finished uh, um, at that time, and uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have a new uh, we'll have a new uh, president at that point. 
Um, do, do you have any information of sort of when the Board of Governors might initiate that search? And that I think probably, probably next year, probably sometime, the, uh, sometime in a year from now. Thank you. Eugenia. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon. I'm from the Davis College. I'm one of the new senators. And I have a question that is related with uh, the future. We're talking almost about something that has happened already. So decisions have been made. We have appeals, et cetera. However, my question is, and of other faculty that I have been talking about, what comes next? And we know that in the industry, when something like this happens, they immediately have a team already working on different scenarios to start to keep the new institution because it's going to be almost a new institution forward. Now we know that President Guy is going to be for, for well, at this point uh, until in with us until 25. We don't know Dr. Reed, um, the, the provost office, how it's going to be changing. What's going to happen next? Do you have a team that's already looking at the possible scenarios? Because one of the consequences that you see now, we are starting to lose good talent. And that is what makes the university. Well, I, let me answer that. I, I think that, first of all, I appreciate what you're saying. And uh, I believe that what uh, what is going to be next, in, and and I have explained this a couple of times, and I and I welcome the opportunity to uh, to talk with you individually whenever you'd like to. But, uh, you know, we're going through a process uh, that is going to allow us to, to be financially, uh, structurally, um, and uh, and I believe academically much stronger. And the point that I'm the point that I'm making, and the point that I just made earlier about uh, a bad analogy about college football, how all of a sudden the world's just changed, it's, uh, it's turned upside down. This post-pandemic world is very much that. And so the reason that we're doing this process right now is that uh, we had a structural deficit of about forty-five million dollars, and. Uh, that simply meant that our our revenues uh, uh, were not uh, we were not meeting our revenue projections. Uh, some of it due to uh, enrollment, some of it uh, due to um, the post pandemic um, set of issues that uh, have come up. And so we made a decision as an institution to move forward very aggressively to reposition ourselves so that we will be uh, much more competitive in the marketplace over the next period of time. And that, and that's, uh, you know, I see a very, very uh, robust opportunity for the university to, uh, over the next uh, several years to be in a, in a space that will um, allow us to um, be more than competitive. Now we want to maintain our R1 status. We think that that's enormously important and we are working very diligently to make sure that that's the case. We want to grow our research uh, uh, efforts. We also want to make certain that we identify programs that uh, are going to carry us into the future uh, in ways that we haven't thought of in the past. And we're also taking a look at a number of different scenarios, whether it be online, whether it be stackable degrees, whether it be micro-credentials, um, all the kinds of things that I think uh, will uh, allow us as a large public land grant university to uh, remain competitive in what is going to be an increasingly competitive world. Um, and the final thing is, I'll just say this again, you know, we, we, we're putting a lot of emphasis on, on student success. We think that that's enormously important. Obviously, we want to have not only students come here, but we want to have them graduate. We want to have them be very successful. Um, we do have a uh, we do have a um, demographic cliff. About twenty five percent fewer students are coming into higher education, um, and that is something that we want to we want to increase our market share, um, and uh, to do so in in ways that uh, I think will be very. Um, will be very helpful to, to, to the university and to the state that we serve. And the final thing is, is we want to make certain that as a land grant university, we re reassert the value proposition of higher education. I know that uh, last time when I mentioned this, that I got some notes saying, well, you're accusing us. I'm not accusing anyone. I'm accusing me. I've been university president for 43 years. I do not know how 
when I became a university president that 95% uh, of the American public thought that higher education was a positive, and now 36%. The latest Gallup poll shows that we simply have lost support of the public, uh, of the American public. And I think that that is a very uh, unique opportunity for us as a, as a, as a public land grant university to establish that relationship uh, with our publics that we are a valued um, asset to the, to the state and, and to the nation. So that's where we're going to be in a couple of years. Just, just to, to finish, do you have a team that's already working in the future? Because there are many things that you mentioned that are uncertain, that you, it's, they're out of control of the university. Do you have a team working strongly on the future? Oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're right in the, in, in the door next, next to me. Yes, we have, a very, uh, we have a very strong team of people who are working diligently about taking a look at what we're going to look at uh, in three, five, uh, 10 years down the line. So I think that for us faculty, one mm -hmm. thing that will help us is to know your, plan, your possible scenarios or plan to see how we can help. Well, or, yeah. And, and, and I, I appreciate that opportunity. And uh, obviously um, at my next, uh, at my next um, faculty uh, or at my next state of the university address after we've been through this particular process, I will outline where I think that we will uh, need to have um, a common approach to where we're going to be over the next uh, Four or five years, uh, and and let me let me just say I don't like to I don't like to point out to other places, but you know, I was just with the president of Penn State. They have a, I mean, they are going through a terrible time. They have a two hundred million dollar uh, budget deficit, one hundred twenty five million dollars at Rutgers, one hundred million dollars at Kansas, uh, seventy five million dollars at Kansas State. You can go on down the line. Almost every institution has this same problem. We happen to be approaching it differently. We're doing it fast and targeted, and we're going to be through this where every other institution is going to hang it, be hanging on into, uh, into a long, I think, into a long uh, winter. And, and I, don't, I don't think that that's in our interest. The short-term pain we are experiencing has substantial upside for us. We're one of the few institutions, let me just point this out to you, we're one of the few institutions, and let me step back one step. For the, the, the United States is, as a country's bond rating was downgraded um, by, by Fitch. And uh, that means that uh, people have lost confidence in, in the collateral called the United States in some way or other. Uh, we are one of the few institutions that had our bond ratings affirmed by both Fitch and s &P. And the reason they affirmed it is the fact they said what we're doing as an institution is exactly what needs to be done in order to preserve and increase the ability for the institution to be competitive. And, and that gets lost in this discussion. We have had an external affirmation that this institution is doing exactly what it should be doing, whereas many institutions have, uh, have not had that same affirmation. Does that help you? I think that helps many people. And I hope we can continue listening to, to what's coming. The yeah. good Thank, Thank you. you, and I appreciate it. Anytime you need to talk to me, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, other questions? I do have just one follow-up, Rob, if I could, on um, student life. You said there was a survey coming. I'm just wondering, are they also doing um, some other more um, detailed review in a different, in addition to getting customer feedback, but also in terms of right sizing and making sure that they have the right number of employees and perhaps maybe could contribute in some way to us getting to this 45 million number? Yeah, so much like academic service units and the review of strategic initiatives as to what cuts have already been taken and what services we're providing and level of service and FTEs. Um, President Gee has asked for the non-academic units to do that. Um, we've heard um, that the faculty have requested that student life go through that. And so we've spoken with Corey Ferris, 
And um, that work on reviewing the data on what student life provides, how it provides us, the cost of providing that is also underway in addition to the self, as part of the self-assessment and the stakeholder surveys going forward. And so I think uh, there are some meetings actually to occur in the next couple of days. And I think the goal is much like we sent the strategic initiative self-study, I mean, the stakeholder study out within the past day or so that student life will do something in the near future. But yes, there, there is work going on. You know, we've, I think we've shared some information about what facilities has gone through in terms of reductions or thinking about things differently. We're going to go through, um, President Gee has asked the administrative units to go through a similar process. And so student life will definitely be a part of that. Yeah, and and Frankie, I also uh, remember if you, uh, it, I think I mentioned already that I have talked to uh, Rick Stasloff, who is uh, at uh, at RPK about uh, about uh, also helping us take a look at that, so that we have uh, we have both an internal and an external view, the same way we're doing doing um, with our other projects. And and if, if I could just do one thing very historically, because you and I talked about this the other day, and I'm talking. To Frankie now is the fact that I think something that people don't realize is the fact that since 2014, the university has lost uh, about $35 million in terms of uh, state support. And, uh, and the diminishing state support has been relevant in a number of institutions, but certainly we have not been immune from that. And as Rob said, we are now uh, clawing back in many ways. We did get, we went through Two things. One, we went through what we call a freedom agenda to get much more, much more uh, allowance in terms of dealing with state bureaucracy, and that has been very helpful. The second thing, of course, is the fact that we work very hard to get a funding formula in place, and that formula will kick in next year, and that should be very helpful to the university in terms of uh, overall state support. But uh, uh, but that thirty-five million dollars. Um, uh, that has resulted in in the non-academic units uh, having carried the major uh, the major burden in 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 meeting that thirty five million dollar uh, reduction. Uh, we are down five hundred and fifty uh, 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 people who are outside of the academic uh, outside of the academic enterprise. And um, so, when you're thinking about it, this is the first time. When we when we face this uh, this structural deficit, this is the first time that we really have had um, an ongoing robust review of all of the units, including the academic units, because a we felt we had to, and b if we're really going to reform ourselves, we can't continue to uh, kick this ball down the down the um, down the field and just continue to um, expect our our staff to take the uh, the brunt of this. And so we're all going to uh, have an opportunity to uh, take a look at all of these issues and see where we can best reform ourselves. Thank you. Any final questions? Scott. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask one more kind of following up on uh, Rob's discussion about the other non the non academic units. Um, I think I think one thing that's been a positive on the program portfolio reviews is that a clear timeline, um, metrics, um, those kinds of things were shared um, openly so people knew what to expect and when to expect things to happen. I know the non-academic units are much more challenging because their roles are so different, but is the, would it be possible to share some information about process and timelines and metrics of how those units would be evaluated um, in the, the context of, you know, finding efficiencies and, and savings toward the budget deficit. Sure, so I think um, for strategic initiatives, I think I just walked through the timeline of bringing things for the September board meeting, and we can talk about that for other units. The one thing I do want to reemphasize, though, is, and President Gee mentioned this, so for IT, um, and I've talked about this before, but I think it's worth saying, 
you know, back in April, we decided we needed to do a merger and identify some savings for IT. And within six weeks, we had announced a plan to merge our overall IT and HSC system. And through the budget cuts that were implemented June 30th, which was three or four weeks later, I think there were eight positions that were non-renewed moving forward. And so those folks got 60 days notice and moved on from the institution. And so I understand and appreciate you want a process and a timeline of how everything's going to move going forward. But there is an example, and there are a number of those on the non-academic side where we said, we have to make an adjustment from a cost perspective, let's go. And so not only has that been announced and those cuts done, but there were 17 positions where we completely redid those. Those have already been posted, and most of those positions have already been filled with folks who had to reapply internally for their jobs. So I just need folks to recognize that over the past period of time, when we've talked about the need to make cuts, we've moved quicker to move forward on that particular piece for the institution. So I hear you, we'll get those for strategic initiatives and other units as to that process, um, but, but we have moved um, where we can, um, almost I would say in real time to make some of those adjustments. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just add again, Scott, that uh, let me go back to what I said before. Uh, we have been going through this transformation process for some time. Um, uh, uh, the $35 million uh, uh, that we have lost from the state, that has been covered by the loss of uh, 550 plus people, you know. So let's just, let's just be very clear about uh, the fact that we have already been consolidating, eliminating, and, uh, and doing what we think is in the best interest of the institution. And so we will certainly put, put that forward. I think, in fact, I think that's a great... Uh, point you're making is let's let's have that uh, have that uh, be part of our process but we have had a process which is because it's had no direct impact uh, on on faculty uh, per se that we have been going through for some time and and now uh, I think that uh, it's important for everyone to understand exactly what we have been doing Thank you all. Any other questions? Okay, thank you to all of you for, um, for helping clarify and um, communicating with us. Any new business at this time? Very well, do I have a motion to adjourn? Eloise, did you did you want to say something or was that a motion? That was a motion to adjourn by Eloise. Thank you, Eloise. Do I have a second? <laughs> I heard a noise. Stand seconds. Very well. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>